For as far as there's a need for a why, these are the main reasons. I've been thinking about making a series of videos for a while, but it would be a lot of work and could attract only a few viewers. So this is testing the water, so to speak. And then there's the summer of mod exposition. Although I consider this a toy problem, I put in a lot of work to understand what is going on and even more work to show it as a linear train of thought. I took a computational approach rather than an algebraic one. I hope you'll get to understand the reasoning. The conjecture looks at the following rules. Either multiply by three and add one, or divide by two. From a starting value, there will be a chain of next values. This example shows what's happening if the starting value is lucky 13. The chain ends with a repeating pattern. Conjecture states that this will happen, whatever the starting value is. It's important to understand that this implies two things. There are no other cycles, there are no chains that go off to infinity. The challenges then are that we cannot use the algebra we know well. And there will be a lot of interesting things happening that will not lead to further insight. If you hope to watch this on a phone, then you'll notice that the screen is too small. There's simply too much data to show in certain cases. This is also the first time I'm making a video, so it might not live up to what you're used to. Those who are familiar with the conjecture know that the brute force approach looked at numbers to 10 to the 60th. I will show shortly how big of a number that actually is. I'm just working on a laptop and don't have a whole data center at my disposal. This video presents a linear train of thought. It is therefore limited. With all the red herrings, there are many interesting patterns that would each deserve a video of their own. This calculation shows that all the clock cycles of my laptop since the beginning of the universe would not even get me to 10 to the 60th, even if I could check each number in a single clock cycle. These two values show how incomprehensibly large of a range we are talking about. However, compared to numbers that are used regularly, it is absolutely tiny, as we can see in these examples. To think that we can close to max or even exceed 10 to the 60th is an expectation that you should set aside. The following topics have been used to try to tackle the conjecture. While they lead to interesting patterns, each deserving our full attention, ultimately they won't get us very far. The why behind some of these will be shown later in the video. I found that looking at chains and ranges was more productive, and those needed to be long chains and large ranges. Well, as long and as large as you can get to with just a laptop. Again, going into these topics much deeper does not get us to where we want to be. We will be looking at the problem in different ways, each providing a bit of insight. There are two main pillars we need, induction and equivalence. Simply put, if we know the conjecture to be true within a certain range, for instance by using brute force, and we can make a logical jump from the limit of the range to a new limit, we are using induction. This jump can then, hopefully, be repeated and we have a complete proof. Equivalence means that if we have two things that can be used interchangeably, Aspects learned from one can then be applied to the other. We start with simple examples and come to an important insight. Then we'll see that this, in turn, leads to even deeper insights. We'll go through three chapters. You'll see why they are titled as such. In this example, we look at a simple chain from 40 to 1. Here we already see many of the red herrings like small numbers and looking at numbers individually. The first insight comes when we divide the number up. Here we see the number being split in a head, a body and a tail, separated by dots. See if you can already spot where this is going. It is important to know that things are going to be this way. Explanation will be illustrated by the output of a program on the command line. While looking into the problem, I used Python. But for the demos, I used JavaScript and Node.js, thinking I would reuse the code in the browser. This was based on a rather naive idea on how the video would be created. Yeah, making the video was a lot trickier than understanding the conjecture. And yes, understanding binary numbers is important to understand the conjecture. Let's look at the clearer example. The command line allows expressions. I assume that this does not require additional explanation. The head and tail commands on the command line are not related to what is shown here, in case you were wondering. They just limit which lines are included or omitted. Focus on what happens after the last dot. 5 goes to 16 and then 8, 4, 2, 1. And we have revealed that the cycle of the conjecture is already happening. At 1946 we see that the cycle gets a little whack, 
as a result of the bit that drifts from the middle part, the body, to the end, the tail, but the cycle recovers and continues. So we see that the cycle does not only happen at the end of the chain, but is happening all the time, hidden out of view. We can already see three categories. We can take a closer look. This example is for the category highly divisible. This example is for the category highly non-divisible. It already shows recovery of the cycle. For the third category, we have two examples. See if you can already spot where this is going. It is a bit of a red herring. As you can see, the number multiplied by two shifts all the bits. Adding them creates many ones in the succession. Adding one then creates a domino effect that turns them into zeros. The reason it is called a bit of a red herring is because looking at this in binary makes the situation very clear. However, before looking at numbers in the binary form, I thought I was onto something here. If you take a number and look at modulo some power of 2, then special values hint that after 3n plus 1, you'll get a highly divisible number. I was not the only one. If we add the binary representation, it becomes clear what is going on. But somehow, multiply by 4 and adding 1, or alternatively appending a 0 and a 1 to the number in binary, deserves a place in the Internet Encyclopedia of Internet Series. I hope to show that this third category is now a lot easier to understand. You did not ask, but I'm showing that this list can very simply be extended. The limit is the screen, not the calculations. Take a look at the chain starting at 520. However, instead of putting the results straight under each other when dividing by 2, we remove the last zero and put a space in its place. We lose track at the cycle of the tail, but we can now focus on what happens at the head. If we now skip the division steps, then the behavior of the head becomes even clearer. It is just a slope with a fixed value. Taking a random number by blindly slamming on the keyboard, we can now represent the bits as different colors. Green is a 1 bit and blue is a 0 bit. In this particular case, we can see that the tail is gaining on the head. Here again, we have to consider the importance of what we are observing. The next picture shows an alternative to the function we are studying. Instead of adding 1 after multiplication by 3, we add 0. It means that the tail is no longer able to do its thing, but the slope of the head seems unaltered. They are so similar in fact, that if we put the screenshots in a photo editor as different layers, and we choose to combine them by difference, we see how beautifully the bits of the head line up. In this picture, they are offset by a single picture. Look what happens when we line them up perfectly. We see that the head has its own thing going on. It's only when the tail catches up with it that we see a difference. In fact, this does not just happen with 3n plus 1 and divide by 2. Compare 5n plus 1 and divide by 4 using the same number. Or 7n plus 1 and divide by 8, again the same number. Here we already see several of the mentioned red herrings in action. And it leads to a profound conclusion. Larger numbers are actually easier to understand. Also, the likelihood of a cycle or a runaway is now vanishingly small. The tail will always catch up with the head. For the body, we can use the following reasoning. In other words, the size of the body has no influence on the immediate sequence of numbers in the chain. Although it gets the shortest amount of focus, it is actually the most important part. The tail will shed parts of the body faster than the head can add to it. And understanding this for a given size shows us that this is true for any size. To explain the derivative, we'll have to go in depth into calculus. Well, maybe not. I got a swirl from a website that allowed its use for free, but with some attribution. 
just mentioning that I didn't draw it. A simple example should suffice. When we look at a function that produces the square of a number, then we see that we can find the next square by adding the number twice and add 1. There is, of course, much more to derivatives, but for now all we care about are two properties. The derivative gives us locally a piece of information about the step from one number to the next. And adding from zero and adding all the local pieces of information brings us in very close proximity to the number we are looking at. The smaller the step, the better the proximity, but we are looking at integers and backers cannot be choosers. Before we continue, it is important to have a feel for what induction means. It is already mentioned, but not explained. This image represents two ranges. The smaller range we have checked by one sort of means or another. Then we try to draw conclusions to see if we can extend the range. In this next image we see a mapping from numbers from one range to the next. Each ring represents a power of 2. The 3n plus 1 crosses the map and goes to a larger ring. Division by 2 takes a step inwards. Animating would be visually very distracting, but here we see a few additional values. If we fill the entire ring, we simply have the same representation, just scaled by a factor of 2. We can do that as many times as we want. The representation shows that from one scale to the next, nothing really changes. While this is not conclusive proof, it shows how induction is supposed to work. An interesting fact is that the numbers seem to undergo precession by about a third of the ring. If we now map the chain of a smallest number, we can see the precession in action. Nothing really changes when we look at a larger number. These two images too are just an illustration, although they already hint at the fact that from one scale to the next, no new behavior is introduced. No cycle and no runaway, but then again we are not even close to 10 to the 60th. Take a look at the following table. There are 8 columns. We see the 3 categories that are mentioned before. The first column are numbers that are highly divisible. The last column are numbers that are highly non-divisible. The sixth column, starting with 5 goes to 4, is the third category that are one step removed from being highly divisible and are governed by the OEIS series. The remainder of the columns all have the same value. See if you can already spot where this is going. The numbers form a palindrome. But in the second sequence we can see what happens in the first column. This means there is a relationship between the palindrome and the highly divisible numbers. It was not immediately clear to me and the implementation underwent several revisions, but the last column is governed by the exact same palindrome, albeit 1 minus the value. And the third category is governed by the palindrome as well, after applying 3n plus 1. This image shows several values of the third category, and we can see that this is not dependent on the scale. If we map out all the numbers of the OEIS series, we get to the following map. Alternate numbers map to highly divisible immediately, or they map to a multiple of 5 which then goes to 16. This too does not change with scale. The terminal lets us look at only a limited set of numbers. This image shows a plot of the palindrome for the first 8000 or so numbers. The lines indicate where either 3n plus 1 or division by 2 would map to. The important notice is that the palindrome shows no gap or jump. Same for the first 16,000 values or 32,000 values. If we can show equivalence of the palindrome with a the derivative, then we have demonstrated that the function we are studying cannot have gaps or jumps either. It is then important to see whether the second property we consider holds. Summing over all the values up to a number should get us in the proximity of that number. We can see that this is the case, and that this is independent of scale. The last series took quite a while to calculate on my laptop. The demo does not do it justice. We are running into the limit on what can be achieved by brute force. The question is, what is this good for? Well, if we use the number as an index within the palindrome, we can then use the value to predict the number of the first few steps. In other words, we have local information how to get from one value to the next, just as with the true der derivative. And, as we have just seen, just as with a true derivative, we can sum over all the steps. 
Also, as we have just seen, since there can be no gaps and no jumps, it means that the function we are studying can have no gaps and no jumps. This then, in turn, rules out cycles and runaways. We can use the palindrome value to fast forward in the chain. And since one value in the palindrome leads to another value in the palindrome, it means that we can always fast forward, albeit sometimes with just one or two steps. Let's see some predictions in action for highly indivisible numbers. As we do not want to be bogged down by any individual number, we now take a look at a very important overview. It shows that the predict value is a measure of the number of steps that a highly indivisible number can take in succession, and it shows that this number of steps is limited. Recall that we summed over the palindrome and saw that the value only goes up very slowly. Here we see an overview of what our goals were. And we see an overview of what is accomplished. Both the box representation and the palindrome independently are proof of the conjecture. Representing the tail as only a fixed number of bits shows a limited look of what is going on. Using the palindrome and the predict value instead gives us a wider look. The predict value is the main property. I've been looking at this for a while now, so I can understand if this goes all very quickly. You can go back and look at each of the points being made here. What we already knew about the conjecture, and what is shown so far, gives us confidence that exceptions are highly unlikely, but we cannot escape the nagging voice. Again, the predict value is the main property. We will now look at the secondary property, one that is very strongly related to the predict value. If we think of the chain of numbers as participants in a relay race, we can again see the three main categories. The palindrome shows us that most predict values are plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2, so they are meandering. We have a strong intuition from the first part of the video that the chains will finish, so we are going to focus on the chains that go off into the wrong direction and what we can learn about them correcting their course. We use two terms, although I've seen others coin different terminology. Again, we are not going to look at individual numbers, but we are going to look at ranges and collections. Since we want to see if there is a pattern, we look at the difference between numbers. Here we see the result of some of the files. Each file contains the steps from one number with a given return length to the next, where the step is the difference between the numbers. The first thing that jumps out is that the differences add up to a power of 2. What the first value is, or what exactly causes the step sizes, is not clear. I did not look further into that. But what jumps out next is that not all values for return lengths are valid. And a small jump from one return length to the next has a small jump in the power of 2 that represents the repeat volume. And a larger jump in return length also has a larger jump in repeat volume. It is possible to consider the jumps in return lengths as a sequence of 2s and 3s. However, if we always take 2, then we can represent the sequence as zeros and 1s. While I do not pretend to know what causes the pattern, the bottom of the screen shows the sequence that helps calculate return lengths for numbers that are practical to calculate with a laptop. More on this later. Unfortunately, just as the step sizes are not clear, the predict values related to each of the steps is not clear either. But then again, we are not trying to explain every detail, since many are red herrings. We want to have an understanding that helps see the proof. What is clear, however, is that a number with a given return length is followed by a number with a smaller return length. If return length as a property holds, then this relationship is a requirement. We need the return length to prove that there is no runaway, and thus we can silence that nagging voice. If we extend the overview from the predict value we saw previously with the return length, we can see for many values at once that this is true. Every series ends with a return length of 3. While the initial return length on a line does not seem to make sense, at least it gives us some insight in the behavior of the return length. If we filter out a specific return length, in this case 6, we indeed see that all the values have the same length, although they seem to be very different. If we further filter on a given return length, it starts to become more regular. Interesting is that at minus 6 we have very regular columns, while at minus 5 the middle columns have two values in some pattern. 
The pattern is interesting, but ultimately not important, so I'm not going to explain it. The whole exercise of understanding the return length is to silence that nagging voice about the potential runaways. The following overview gives us insight into the predict value in relation to the return length. Any return length is limited by the maximum value that the predict value can have. Look at return length 19. There exist values with a return length of 19 with predict values up to and including minus 6. We saw this in the filtered list. We can now state that there does not exist any value that has a return length of 19 with a higher predict value than minus 6. This makes sense. If the predict value tells us the length of the series, then each step in the series has to have a lower predict value, while at the same time it has to have a lower return length. The inverse is not true. Any predict value can start the series with any return length. But once given, the series needs to follow a monotone decreasing sequence. If we know that a given return length has a maximum predict value, then this leads to a question. What is the distribution of the predict values within a given return length set? We know that the size of the set of numbers with the same return length is limited to the repeat volume of that return length set, although the set itself can repeat indefinitely. We can determine the distribution for sufficiently small return lengths by brute force. Here we see the distribution for some of the smaller values. Look at the last three values, that might come in handy. Given that the repeat volume grows by 2 or by 4, the repeat volume for even relatively small return lengths gets very, very large very quickly. At the return length of 38, which the overview showed has a repeat volume of 2 to the 62, we are already out of range of brute force. So obtaining the distribution for return length of 63, as shown here, cannot have been done by sheer raw computing power. But let's look at 32, only because it fits on the screen more easily. If we take the next column as values that are the difference of two values of the column before, we can see something interesting. The whole of the series reduces to 1. I used a spreadsheet to see this. At first I had the spreadsheet looking like this. I had no idea where the values 1, 5, 9 and 7 came from. Looking at many return length sets, I thought I had figured it out, but I failed to reproduce the distribution. That is, till I extended the spreadsheet. We see the same pattern of the last values repeating. However, sometimes it's three values, sometimes it's two. It's interesting that the columns sum to the value that is the last in the next column. Like the repeating zeros and ones, there's a pattern in the columns but that is outside the scope of this presentation. Before we get to the last leg of this presentation, let's review what we have achieved. This then leads to the final and most important representation of the series of predict values. Here we see again the predict value and the related return length in light brown, as we have seen before. Added in blue is now the number represented as a residue of the modulus of the repeat volume of the return length set. See if you can already spot where this is going. Compare what happens to 55 and 87. Compare this to 151 and 183. We see that each of those lines goes from 23 to 3 and then 1. And in the lower part we see 207 and 463 go to 23 followed by 3 and then 1. We now have a clearer look at the highly non-divisible numbers, the numbers that the nagging voice was telling could either have a cycle or a runaway. These numbers have their own hidden set of steps, and these steps will scale with the size of the repeat volume associated with their return length. So while it looks that the series goes up in size, internally each number just gets added a multiple of their repeat volume. Again we see the same pattern that only differs in scale. Having the command line tool allowed me to check, check, double check. But apart from the numbers getting bigger and the overview getting slower, nothing changes. While larger numbers, according to the palindrome, get larger predict values and longer possible series of numbers, 
it is still only the multiple of a modulo that really gets bigger. This means that the chance that there being a runaway beyond the part that we checked by other means like brute force is non-existent. One of the ideas we have used is induction. Let's see what induction can bring us. For the last leg of the journey, we are going to focus on the maximum predict value in a return link set. If induction holds, we should be able to find the NEOs with relatively little effort, compared to brute force that is. The concept of P versus NP means that the effort of finding a solution should not get out of hand when the scale of the problem gets larger. Here we see the overview again, now with the NEO and an indication of the numbers of decimals. The solution consists of starting with the previously found NEO. We then add the repeat volume of a smaller return length set. We do this till we can apply 3n plus 1. We then repeat this till we hit upon the correct return length. As was explained before, this is a process of applying induction. So let's look at a milestone value. In this case, we are not just looking at the NEO, the value with the highest predict value, but also at the second highest. We already saw this NEO at the bottom of the overview. Realize what was just accomplished. A number, and 22 more, was found that could not have been found by brute force. And here we almost doubled the length in digits compared to the previous example. And we found 44 more numbers like that. We now arrive in the domain of 10 to the 60th. Of the 70 or so more numbers, only a portion can be shown. We are now lacking space to show more than the number itself. The NEO has about 181 digits. Each of the 220 seconds are of the same order of magnitude. The pattern of repeating zeros and ones, as shown earlier, is valid for return lengths up to 500 or so. After that, there is a shift in the pattern. So to calculate this NEO, I needed to make some adjustments. Several, in fact. It comes down to a group needed to be skipped. I wanted 8192, but that's not a valid return length. This number is so large, it has 2791 digits. And you may think that now I'm just showing off. I'm not. Although I have no specific way to calculate the pattern of zeros and ones, if looking for a NEO we cannot hit an expected return length, we can then choose to adjust the pattern. It would make the search take more time, albeit just a little. But we are not necessarily limited by having no procedure. Just to remind us what we are actually looking at. The NEO is the value with the highest predict value within a return length set. Since the number is negative, it is a measure of how highly non-divisible the number is, and thus how many times we need to apply 3n plus 1 followed by the efficient by 2. Each of the ones is one time we need to apply both alternative ones, before we get to a regime where the two options are not in lockstep. And yes, I call it the maximum predict value, or the highest predict value, even when that number is negative. I refer to its absolute value. Just to do at least a little mathematics, we can look at a simple optimization in checking the expected return length. So by rewriting the multiplication step followed by a division step, we can check the expected return length in four operations. One addition, one multiplication, one division and one subtraction. By the way, calculating this NEO took about 4 minutes on my laptop. I have not optimized anything yet. It only takes a fraction of a second to calculate the finish length, which is 45,174. To realize what all this means, the NEO is the one number of a return length set that has the highest predict value. As you have seen from the series, each number goes to a number of another return length set that is shorter. The NEO in particular hits every NEO of shorter return length sets in succession. That is, 
the NEO plus some multiple of the repeat volume of the returning set. With a complete understanding of the Colitz conjecture, we can now look at a simple example of a change starting from 57. The first column is the step number. The second column is each next number in the chain. The third number is the predict value. The fourth and last column is the return length of that number. Buckle up Dorothy, Texas is going bye bye. Now you can say that I'm just showing off. Why stop here? Well, the pattern broke. I wanted to go to the predict value of 16384, but the end result was an error message that the chosen return length was not valid. That was after some 30 hours, give or take. I happened to have captured some values in between. This one was not the largest, but had a nice predict value of just below 16000. It was about 300 return lengths away from my goal and about 160 return lengths before the pattern broke. Calculating the expected return length itself is a very simple operation. The return length is called the secondary property because there is a strong relationship between the maximum predict value and the return length. The return length minus the maximum predict value minus 1 gives us the repeat volume. So all you need to know is which predict values are valid. And that is what the patterns of zeros and ones is used for. I wanted to revisit the attempt for a large NEO after making this video, but this turned out to be a lot more work than expected. So maybe sometime in the future. So how big is this number? Well, it's 10 to the 60th to the 60th times 10 to the 227th, all squared. Mega fathom indeed. So, to iterate, the solution is based on induction and equivalence and we looked at the problem from multiple angles. The solution consisted of three major steps, building intuition and finding two major properties. <coughs> so we can draw conclusions from three aspects. And we have achieved three main goals. What's next? I'm not sure yet. There are options and alternatives. If you've made it all the way to the end, bravo! Thanks for watching.